please start the webinar. And we see media. Ready? Good afternoon and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may send it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's council, excuse me, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Councilmember Pierina Sanchez, Chair of this Committee on Housing and Buildings. I want to thank you all for joining today's hearing to discuss accessory dwelling units and basement apartment legalization. The committee will also hear several bills relating to matters that I will discuss in a moment. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues from the City Council who are present, Councilmember Barron. And Councilmember Felice is with us virtually. It has been 18 long months since historic rainfall during Hurricane Ida flooded tens of thousands of homes and took 11 New Yorkers from basement apartments in Queens. The dangers faced by residents in unregulated units is undeniable. I want to lift up and honor some of those lives that we tragically lost that day. Yue Lian Chen, Hon She Leng, Darlene Li, Lob Sam, Lama and his parents, Angelou Lama and Ming Ma, Mr. Bravo. These lives are a reminder that when we talk about basement apartments, the stakes are people's lives. For nearly a decade, advocates for basement apartment legalization have fought for the legalization of basement units as a way to bring existing dwelling units up to residential code by assuring they have proper exits, enough light and air to be safe, in a framework similar to how the city brought unpermitted loft apartments in formal industrial spaces in 1982, lo loft law could be used. Legaliz legalizing accessory dwelling units, which include basement apartments, garages, and more that can be converted to legal units in New York City, are an opportunity to make New Yorkers safer where they already live, as well as an opportunity for the city to increase its much needed affordable housing stock. But as these apartments currently exist, they present several regulatory and safety challenges. As climate change and climate disasters rage forward, as they have in the past years, flood risk has become a more prominent reason for seeking basement conversion. But these units can also be fire traps, carbon monoxide poisoning risks, and all of this must be mitigated. It is hard to know the precise number of these units, yet advocates, think tanks, and even the city have provided stunning estimates. A Pratt Center analysis for the base campaign finds that there's at least 200,000 potential basement and cellar units. With strategic zoning changes, it could be even 400,000. The city estimated roughly 100,000 New Yorkers already live in 50,000 unregulated basement apartments. Regional Plan Association has estimated 114,000 ADUs could be further legalized in the next decade in New York City. And most recently, the city's controller, Brad Lander, estimated that there could be as many as 424 basement and cellular units citywide. The, re the reality is that tenants, often working class immigrants, people of color, live in these ap apartments outside of the formal renter market. Being unregulated means that there are inherent risks associated with basement apartments, including unsafe housing conditions, fires, illegal evictions, and with growing consequences of climate change, flooding. We want property owners to come forward and legalize these units so that the tenants already living there can have safe and habitable homes, and because it's one way the city can start addressing the housing crisis. The East New York basement pilot legislation passed in 2019 was one way that this city council worked to encourage this work at the local level. But the program has faced challenges. The COVID-19 pandemic and budget cuts left few projects initiated, so much so that the deadline, the initial deadline for applying to the program was extended. The cost of construction and relocation was also greatly exceeded the city's maximum subsidy of $120,000, creating an unattainable cost for many homeowners. Only six applied and are going through the program. My hope with this hearing today is that we can learn from the challenges to inform future efforts and legislation. We cannot wait for another hurricane season to pass. 
We're hearing resolution number 161, sponsored by Council Member Hanif, which calls on the state to pass legislation to legalize basement apartments in New York City in support of our state partners who are considering this exact issue. Finally, I want to recognize the advocates from the base coalition who have advocated for these changes for years. Chaya CDC, CHPC, Communities Resist, Cypress Hills, Local Development Corporation, Queens Legal Services, Center for New York City Neighborhoods, Pratt Center for Community Development. Next, as we look at retrofitting New York City basement homes to meet the challenges of climate change, we're also considering several pieces of legislation today. Two bills come to the committee at the request of the mayor. Intro number 875 relates to technical corrections to the New York City Construction Code, which were last updated by Local Law 126 of 2021. I want to acknowledge up front that this version of the bill includes language re regarding renewable energy credits crafted by the city, by the, by the administration, that this council has serious concerns about. In particular, about the potential for Rexy's renewable energy credits to undermine the robust climate, environmental, economic, and health goals of Local Law 97. Thus, to the extent that Rexies are going to be allowed, we want to ensure proper regulation, including considering caps on their use. I've heard anywhere from 10% of a building's emission reduction to 30%. I look forward to discussing this with DOB in greater detail today and going forward to understand the parameters envisioned by the department to achieve the environmental goals of Local Law 97. The second bill at the request of the mayor is intro number 876, relating to green building standards and repealing section 224.1 of the New York City Charter. In addition, we're going to be hearing intro number 150, sponsored by Council Member Brannon, relating to electric vehicle charging stations in open parking lots and parking garages. And lastly, intro number 886, sponsored by Council Member Powers and I, extending the moratorium on accessory sign violations by another two years to protect our small businesses. We have a lot on the agenda today, and there, are a lot of there is a lot of important work that needs to be done to make this city safer and fairer place to live. To that end, I look forward to a productive discussion with the administration and with advocates today. I would like to thank my staff, as always, my chief, Sam Cardenas, my legislative director, Kadeem Robinson, as well as Housing and Buildings Committee staff, Audrey Sun, Taylor Zaloni, Jose Conde, Charles Kim, Dan, and Dan Krupp. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues uh, who have introductory remarks. But before I do so, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Powers, Councilmember Ressler, and Councilmember Ari Kagan. And Councilmember Carr, who is here as, here as well. Um, Councilmember Powers. Thank you. Nice to see everyone here today. Nice to see my friends from HPD here as well today. Uh, I'm here to speak on a bill that I introduced just recently with the chair and a number of my colleagues, which is related to extending the moratorium on uh, signage against, against enforcement on signage here for many of our storefronts and small businesses here. This is a law that we passed last term. I think we've extended at least once uh, in response to a number of sweeps that were happening where businesses were getting fines for, sometimes out of their knowledge, illegal signage. And it was a common sense law to pass back then to give us all a little more time to figure out what's the right path forward. And as we see the expiration of that law earlier this year, it was felt urgent, but common sense uh, to reintroduce uh, a bill to continue to uh, extend that moratorium. I am, I'm no on a note, I do see the administration is supportive of that, so I'm thankful of them. And I also want to note there, which I did not know about, have a program that you can call 311 to get a no fine inspection, which I think is a great strategy for how to handle small businesses in this city, is give them tools, hold out on finding them. And frankly, to me, I don't see why we are finding small businesses for things that are not related to public health or public safety or anything like that. It feels sort of common sense to continue this in perpetuity or to create a better program here and thank the DOB for their work on this in the past as we had the moratorium in place. So thank you to all my uh, colleagues. I encourage everyone to sign on to it. It's a really easy way to help the small businesses here in the storefronts all in our districts. And I want to thank the uh, businesses in my district who raised this to me at the end of last year because I would not have known about it if not for those businesses who brought it to my attention. Uh, with that, I, yeah, I'll hand it back to the chair. Thanks, everyone, for indulging me. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Powers. And I join you in hoping that our colleagues uh, sign on to the legislation. Uh, so I will now turn, uh, turn it over to our committee counsel, Audrey Sun, to administer the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Yes. Thank you. You may begin when ready. And just a note to the members of the administration who are present to answer questions, I, I'll administer, administer the oath. Uh, again, if, um, if at any point you're called up to respond to questions. Good afternoon, Chair Sanchez and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Kim Darga, the Deputy Commissioner for Development at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Joined by my colleague, Lucy Jaffe, Assistant Commissioner for Housing Policy to discuss HPD's work related to accessory dwelling units, ADUs. ADUs are secondary self-contained dwelling units located on the same lot as a primary dwelling. ADUs can play an important role in Mayor Adams' goal to address our long-standing housing and affordability crisis and to increase New York City's housing supply by 500,000 units over the next decade by providing additional housing opportunities in low-density communities. In addition, they represent an important tool in combating the city's long-standing housing crisis and the city's legacy of housing segregation. Neighborhoods that are low density generally have had very few lower cost housing options, including rental homes, effectively excluding low and moderate income New Yorkers of color. ADUs are another tool we can use to create housing opportunities in these neighborhoods that have been out of reach for generations. We also recognize that many New Yorkers have created ADUs outside of the current legal requirements for a, very, for a variety of reason, reasons. Some homeowners need rental income to be able to remain in their homes, to make space for an aging parent who needs to be close by, or to house a child who's having trouble finding somewhere to live in the city where they were raised. Many renters are finding that illegal ADUs, often located in basements and cellars, are the only housing they can afford in their community. These basement apartments already serve as an important supplement to the housing stock that disproportionately serves low-income owners and tenants, immigrants, and other New Yorkers who lack access to affordable options in the housing market. While ADUs can provide much-needed housing, complex and often outdated codes and regulations make it difficult to bring these units into safe and legal use, creating the potential for unsafe living conditions where residents lack sufficient light, ventilation, and egress. Flooding can exacerbate safety risks for basement occupants because their homes are below street level. As we tragically learned in the aftermath of Hurricane Ida, this can be a matter of life and death. The city has been working to make it easier to create accessory dwelling units and to legalize basement apartments without compromising on safety. The city committed to making it easier to build new ADUs and Mayor Adams Housing Our Neighbors Blueprint and Where We Live New York City. The administration has most recently committed to local reforms to make it easier to build new ADUs through the City of Yes, Zoning for Housing and Opportunity, housing opportunity Initiative these commitments build on earlier work through which the city partnered with the city council on a basement pilot program launched in July 2019 in Brooklyn Community Board 5. The goal of the pilot was to test potential strategies to facilitate basement conversions, including understanding the impact of local code changes and the feasibility of bringing basements and cellars into safe and legal residential use. Working with Cypress Hills, Local Development Corporation, HPD contacted roughly 8,000 homeowners, screened roughly 800 for preliminary eligibility, and conducted in-depth physical and financial home assessments for over 100 properties. 12 of these homeowners met basic eligibility standards and expressed interest before the pandemic, and we were actively, and we are actively working with five owners. Working with homeowners to undertake these conversion projects has demonstrated that under current regulations, too few basements can be legally converted and made safe. Even when it is possible, it is at a very significant cost. Regulatory changes at the local and state level to address requirements 
uh, of the multiple dwelling law, along with zoning and building code requirements, are necessary to make basement legalization feasible, as well as to facilitate the development of ADUs. The city also needs the state legislature to amend existing loan authorities as part of a bill package, uh, package called Affordability Plus so that HPD can provide sufficient financing to make basement legalization possible for low and moderate income homeowners. Much of what we need requires state legislation, which is why HPD was supportive of the legislative efforts in Albany last session that would allow the city to waive sections of the multiple dwelling law to facilitate the conversion of basement and cellars to apartments. We will also need local partnership to make it possible to build new accessory dwelling units and legalize basement apartments. And we need support from the council and New Yorkers in recognizing the important function that ADUs and safe legal basement apartments can play in our housing market and in rectifying longstanding obstacles to fair housing that have limited housing choices for New Yorkers of color. Some regulatory barriers, barriers to the development of ADUs and the legalization of basements are rooted in a history of discrimination and exclusion. Removing those obstacles and updating our zoning and housing regulations will allow us to better meet New Yorkers' current and very urgent housing needs and to combat the legacy of redlining and segregation in our city and the region. We'd like to thank the City Council for hosting this conversation today, since we are all going to need to work together along with our colleagues in Albany to address this issue holistically. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. I also have a testimony here from a DOB and MOEC. Are you going to be testifying? Will you be reading it? No? I That's think we're submitting and writing for the written record. Excellent. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. The, the very first question that I want to ask is about a pretty stunning statistic that, that you read during your testimony. 8,000 homeowners were contacted by HPD, 100 were assessed, and 12 ultimately met eligibility. Um, you talked in general about uh, some of the regulatory barriers, but could you, could you break that down further for us? What were some of the particular uh, regulatory barriers that got in the way of so many homeowners? Sure, so let me just start by saying we, there were about 21,000 properties in Brooklyn's community, but were five. Uh, that we started with. Of those, approximately 8,000 were potentially eligible just based on data, right? So we're talking about small residential properties. We were looking for owner-occupied properties. Uh, we excluded properties in the coastal flood zone, and there were a few other factors. We also looked at zoning um, as a preliminary screen to make sure that the properties could potentially be eligible. Um, from that was the 8,000. Um, there were about 2,000 of the eight uh, homeowners that uh, engaged in actual conversation um, with either the city or our partners, and of those, about 800 were preliminarily interested. I think that in of itself is a really important takeaway from the pilot program, which is that of the homeowners that were um, surveyed, the interest rate was about 40%, or even 10% if you're looking at the 8,000 that were even contacted. That's a pretty significant rate of interest of homeowners um, that I think were intrigued because this is a way to increase the value of their property, uh, to address the needs of family members for additional housing, uh, to improve their livelihoods by increasing um, income and revenue for their families. Um, so. That, I think, is one takeaway. Um, from that 800, um, we did detailed home assessments um, after looking, doing some pre-screening for the 800, detailed home assessments for uh, just over 100 properties. Those detailed home assessments um, did a deeper dive into potential eligibility. Um, and this was in, like, actually going out to the buildings, inspecting the site, making sure there were not physical um, obstacles that would have prevented a conversion from moving forward, um, making sure that what on paper looked potentially eligible, that in person was actually eligible, 
um, talking to the owners, owners about their ability to undertake a project. Um, so really doing the really in-depth study. Um, before the pandemic started, 12 of those homeowners, uh, so we did cost estimates for the about 100, um, and 12 of those homeowners were interested and thought that um, between the city's program and their own resources could undertake the project. Um, I think had the pandemic not hit, we probably would have had time to go through that process with a few more folks, but unfortunately the, the pandemic really impacted the ability to engage uh, further. Um, so there were 12 owners by February, March 2020 that were interested. Eight of those owners actually submitted to DOB by the legislative deadline. So the, the legislation that um, City Council passed um, that was enacted um, and effective uh, by mid-2019, um, we ended up extending uh, because of the pandemic. The date to file with DOB was um, mid-2021. Uh, so basically eight folks filed by then. Of the eight, we one has closed on financing at this point in time and in, in construction. Four homes are working toward plan approval, and I'm happy to talk more about those uh, in a moment. And unfortunately, three were found ineligible. Um, two of those were related to zoning issues, and one was related to ceiling height, unfortunately. Um, so the nice thing is part of the pilot I think that you know the goal was really to understand the various codes and regulations better and the impact of those codes and regulations as well as other factors on feasibility of conversions. And so will the number of actual buildings that I think are making it all the way through the pilot program process is pretty small. The amount of information that we have collected through the process and what we understand today is much more than we understood a few years ago. Thank you, thank you so much. So five in total uh, is? Five that are active the, in the program at this point. Okay, so five are still in the program. Um, okay, so in fiscal year 2019, a total of $4.5 million in expense funds and $6.8 million in capital funds were added to the basement apartment pilot program. At that time, it was estimated that 5,000 affordable units could be created. Um, pausing to look at this, at that gap, um, well, I guess you spoke to this a little bit on, on why the, the barriers that were faced. So, yeah, let me, let me actually skip that one. Okay, so, so moving to, to the learnings of working with these five property owners, uh, these five homeowners, um, can you talk a little bit about the kind of work that was required for the conversion? What kind of technical assistance did the homeowners need in order to be, to remain in the, in the program at this stage? Sure. So, as I mentioned, I think, you know, on face value, you think, well, we're trying to target about 40 homeowners. We have five active. That doesn't seem like a great ratio, but as I mentioned, um, the goal was really to try to understand the regulations the impact of the regulations and other factors, as well as the code changes authorized by city council, the impact that those would have on uh, viability. Um, and what we, uh, and, and in terms of other factors, uh, one of the things I think we were really interested in understanding was owner interest and what type of support owners would need to navigate a conversion project. Um, so there are a couple takeaways. Um, first, the Regulations are extremely complex. We're talking about building code, zoning, we're talking about state regulations um, that make it pretty complicated even for um, an architect to navigate the process and certainly very complex for a traditional owner that may not be an architect themselves um, to be able to go through this process. Um, and the regulatory framework, in addition, in, beyond being complex, um, the, the regulations impose significant requirements that add um, real cost that make it very difficult for a conversion project to be financed. Um, so let me speak a little more specifically to that. I mentioned, first and foremost, the pilot didn't really address zoning, right? We agreed back in 
pre-2019 that that was gonna be something we would come back to, that we really wanted to look at the, the building code requirements. What we found is that, well, the local code uh, amendments that were authorized as part of the 2019 legislation um, to look at uh, fire safety and ventilation and light um, were certainly, are certainly impactful, but they are not enough. Um, the 2019 code looked at modifications for one family homes converting to two family and for two family adding a sleeping, uh, a kind of a bedroom. They did not deal with a t the requirements for a two family home to be converted to a three family home. The reason that is impactful is because you go from being a private dwelling to a multiple dwelling, then all the state regulations related to the multiple dwelling law come into play. We have found that um, the multiple dwelling law requirements basically double the cost of a conversion project. Um, so costs that may have been a couple hundred thousand are much more than that at this point in time. And, and um, thank you so much for that, Deputy Commissioner. By the way, congratulations, Deputy thank Commissioner. You. Um, can you. Can you talk about what some of those new requirements are when you become a multiple dwelling? Sure. So the multiple dwelling law it imposes um, requirements related to safety of a multiple dwelling, right? So traditional multiple dwelling in New York City, you're talking, you know, a home that is three, four, or five or more stories, right? And, and so the idea is these are individual units and you want to make sure there's sound kind of um, attenuation that you are dealing with egress for multiple units on different floors potentially and fire safety issues. Um, and I think what we have found is that for an existing private dwelling, right, that might be one unit above ground today or two units above ground, um, and you're adding a unit on the ground floor, that those requirements that are really about the height of a, an exist, of a multiple dwelling don't really make sense the same way, right? So one of the requirements of the multiple dwelling law is to address roof safety Okay, well, so we're not, when we're converting a basement to a legal residential unit, we're not changing the height of the home, right, overall. We're just converting use of an existing space. And so a requirement that the roof is no different. The building above ground is no different, right? And so adding requirements like you need a railing or a different parapet on the roof are really completely unnecessary. Um, there are other things in there, like the basement pilot, one of the code requirements coming out of the 2019 legislation was that uh, to deal with fire safety, um, we, uh, there was an agreement to sprinkler the basement apartment, right? That's one of the major risks everyone is concerned with. Um, in converting to a multiple dwelling, you not only have to sprinkler the new basement unit, you also have to install a sprinkler system in the existing units in the home. Wow. Okay, so there are a number of requirements like that that make it very, very expensive. And I think we all need to grapple with whether or not we are actually striking the right balance between safety and feasibility. Great. And I'm gonna ask just one more question and then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, the resolution sponsor, Council Member Honey, for, for some opening remarks on the legislation as well as some questions. Um, so being optimistic uh, about the passage in Albany of, of basement legalization, ADU legis uh, legalization, what do you, what does the administration have in the works in terms of planning for a, a broad scale uh, legalization of the ba of basement apartments? Absolutely. So I'm so glad you asked this. So this administration, this is a real priority, and we're trying to tackle this on many fronts, and we're not waiting for the pilot to be over in order to tackle the issue. Um, certainly the pilot has informed a lot of what we know at this point in time, and we're trying to act on some of that now. Um, first, um, we are continuing to work with folks in the pilot. We are also exploring whether there are um, other ways that we can help owners financially. Um, we have applied to the state for some funding to continue to experiment with that. Uh, at the local level, 
We are, as part of the City of Yes, Zoning for Housing Opportunity Initiative, we are uh, considering citywide tax amendments um, that would particularly look at, um, amongst other things, low density parts of the city um, and how to potentially uh, make conversions or ADUs more feasible. Um, that work is just starting um, uh, and it will take a real partnership with city council um, to tackle that, but it really would mean the ability to, to convert existing basements or cellars or build the ADUs across New York City. Um, so those are a couple of the big things that we're working on. We certainly are very interested in what our state colleagues also do. Um, this really is something that um, needs to be taken seriously both at the city and the state level in order for us to make any real progress. The state requirements, if we don't tackle them, will really limit the ability to do conversions because of financial feasibility issues in New York City. Um, just one other note, the code changes, the building code changes that were authorized in 2019, those have expired at this point, right? If you didn't file by the deadline by June of uh, 2021, um, the deadline is passed, so it's really not open for other folks. So I think in addition to looking at zoning, ultimately we're gonna have to look at the local code again. Thank you, thank you so much, Deputy Commissioner. I, do, I now wanna call on Councilmember Hanif, but I also wanna recognize that we've been joined by Councilmember Caban. Thank you to Chair Sanchez and the Committee on Housing and Buildings for holding this important hearing and including Resolution 161 uh, being included on today's agenda. I also wanna extend gratitude to Councilmember Krishnan and Public Advocate Williams for introducing this resolution alongside me and to the 19 additional council members who have signed on as sponsors. Resolution 161 calls on the state legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation introduced by Assembly Member Epstein and State Senator Kavanaugh that would create a pathway to safely retrofit and legalize basement apartments. Right now, there are at least 100,000 New Yorkers living in basement apartments that are currently classified as illegal. The vast majority of these residents are working class immigrant New Yorkers who cannot afford other types of housing. Because these units are illegal, they do not have safety regulations or protections, and tenants often do not report unsafe conditions out of fear that they will lose their homes. This dynamic has devastating results, as we saw in September 2021, when flooding caused by Hurricane Ida killed 11 people who were living in substandard basement apartments. As the threat of more frequent and severe storms looms on the horizon due to climate change, we must do everything we can to prevent a repeat of this tragedy. With the skyrocketing price of housing in our city, we know that basement apartments are not going to disappear. Bringing these units up to code and making them safe is the best path forward for our communities. This will increase our city's safe housing stock, present opportunities for small homeowners to rent out, and extend tenant protections to those previously carved out. I additionally want to share that as we call on the state to act here, our city needs to step up and lead as well. As a condition of the East New York rezoning, the city committed to operating the basement apartment conversion pilot program, Brooklyn's Community District 5. This program had successfully launched, but in recent fiscal years, funding has been stripped away from the budget. This funding must be restored and expanded. I wanna close by thanking all of the members of the BASE campaign who have led much of the organizing and policy work around this issue. I also deeply appreciate groups presenting recommendations today that could strengthen the legislation further and ensure it can be implemented in a way that meets its intent. I'll pass it back now to Chair Sanchez. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Council Member Hanif. So now I just wanna briefly uh, ask colleagues, so what I'm gonna do is uh, I wanna have folks ask questions if you have them for HPD, and then uh, I would like to ask DOB and MOEC to actually read your testimony into the record because we're doing this live, folks, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's hard to, to juggle, so it'd be good to hear what you all have to say, um, and then we can continue with those questions. So do colleagues wanna ask uh, questions? So I wanna recognize Council Member Barron up first. Uh, thank you very much. The uh, East New York project to me was a failure. It was not a success. 10% uh, certainly isn't a success, and defunding it is certainly not something I would consider successful. 
Uh, secondly, we got to really look into the reasons why all of these uh, homeowners would do this without having it regulated or right, doing it by regulation. Cost is an issue, particularly with architects and all of the, the costs. The bureaucracy of getting permits and, and the regulations is another reason why people do it. And racism uh, is the other reason why people don't go through the system because of uh, things like you mentioned, redlining and, and other kinds of things. There's a lot of racism uh, in, the, in the process. So if we're gonna resolve this, then it has to be a genuine commitment to uh, these pilot projects, not something in these 8,000 people, we got 100 of them and 10%, so we're happy, and then they fund. Uh, to me, that's not my idea of something being uh, successful. So there needs to be money in it for uh, homeowners who are struggling in communities just to meet mortgage and trying to do certain things. There needs to be a financial commitment, not rhetoric, not studies, not pilots, but a real financial commitment and a real streamlining of the regulatory process. Because if that doesn't happen, we're gonna have a, a very big problem. I'll give an example, it may not be totally related, but I had an issue in my community where I think they were building garages in front of the house uh, without getting the proper permits. And someone was coming by who wanted to gentrify our neighborhood and they went and they started um, complaining to the Department of Buildings so they can get fines and they was uh, accumulating a bunch of fines and then when they didn't pay the fines, they were gonna have them in foreclosure. So watch out for that strategy and tactic too, where there are some rich developers that'll send someone around and give all these fines. I was able to get in touch with the Department of Buildings and when we saw the pattern that was happening, the person was not, didn't wanna say who they were, they was just putting it in. We were able to come to a compromise where DOB said, well, you know, the fines were like 20, 30, 40, 50,000. So they reduced all the fines to $1,000 and then they worked with all of the homeowners to get these uh, things legitimized, you know, with funding assistance and with some regulatory assistance. So I think we should put that into place in that kind of context. You know, sometimes we talk about issues, but when you put it in the context of an East New York community or a Brownsville or Harlem or a South Bronx, a community where low income people are challenged, and even if you're homeowners in these communities, there's still a, a lot of challenges. So I would just want you to keep that in mind as we go forth with these uh, bills and regulations. Uh, thank you, Councilmember. Just maybe a couple um, comments. Um, we we understand the frustration on the funding cuts related to the basement program. We were absolutely disappointed, but the city was faced with making some very hard choices at the beginning of the pandemic. Well, let me just say this real quick. Sorry, Madam Chair, for interrupting. I don't want to hear that. Okay, the so city, and, and we're not frustrated. We are livid that these things, so it's not a little passive frustration. Um, and the city does have money. And why didn't it happen? So it, if, if I could um, complete my thought here, we, HPD, we could not allocate, the city couldn't allocate expense funding at the time. There were a lot of other emergencies that the city was addressing. We did raise separately a million dollars to continue the pilot program. The city has continued Madam to Chair, invest. Madam Chair, I do have to leave, and I don't mean to be rude, capital. but I know you keep repeating it, uh, repeating something that just simply is not true. The city didn't have money because of the pandemic. That is simply not true. You're with an agency. We see the whole budget. Okay. We know that is not true. So let's tell the truth and come up with real 
solutions. But that is not true no matter how many more times you say it. Okay. And a million dollars is chump change, as we say in the neighborhood, when it comes to dealing with this issue. Okay, so I can't change the past. I can tell you what we did about it. We raised about a million dollars in non-city sources to continue the pilot program. We did work with every active owner that enrolled by the time the pilot, the pandemic hit. Um, we agree with you. We have to streamline this. Yeah. There is absolutely no question that the myriad regulations and the complexity in negotiating, uh, navigating those regulations is a really significant problem. And um, we agree that um, both in terms of fines, um, this was, I think, one of the lessons learned from what worked in the 2019 legislation, is that we need to be flexible about um, addressing violations and fines for people that are willing to do what they need to do to make, make it right. Um, and we also agree that we need to be able to have resources to help every type of homeowner, that this can't be just a program ultimately that benefits wealthy people that have the means to actually be able to undertake these very expensive projects. Um, and to address all of these things, we really need support both at the local level and dealing with zoning requirements um, code requirements and at the state level related to regulations that make this very difficult for a normal person to be able to actually do. Thank you, thank you, Council Member Barron. And, and it's it's a really good point, right? Fiscal year, fiscal 2023-2027 capital commitment plan has $1.08 million in capital funds for the program. And that's compared to that $6.8 million that was there before. And that's that's the capital side. That's not even the expense side. So just a, a follow-up on the council member's question. So how much have we spent with these with the five homes that we have? I don't have how much we have spent. Um, I can tell you that the final cost for the project that closed on construction was abo above what we can actually lend um, through our loan authority, which is another issue that we have to address that I haven't mentioned yet. Um, HPD uses, um, is authorized under state law to make loans for particular purposes. Um, and the state law that we use uh, limits the amount of assistance that we can provide a homeowner to $60,000 per unit. So for a one-family home converting to two families, that's a maximum of $120,000. The projects, the preliminary cost information that we had from the pilot, from that initial kind of survey work that we did, was that most of the conversion projects would cost between $200,000 and $500,000. Um, the participants that actually move forward in the pilot program, the 12 that started the process, most of them were on the lower end of that spectrum, in part because we don't have the ability to actually help them because of the caps we have under state law. Um, the owner that did close um, so far uh, on the conversion project, close on financing, secure it, is in construction now, the costs were above 120,000. We actually secured other sources of funds to help that homeowner move forward. The four remaining properties in the pilot program have cost estimates now between 500 and a million dollars. For the conversion of one unit, one yes. to two family? Yes. Half a million. So, dollars. and I'm bringing that up because if we don't address these regulations, it is not going to be possible to do this work. What kind of reductions in, in cost do you anticipate that the regulation, regulatory changes? So the MDL requirements have basically doubled the cost of these projects. Um, so if we don't address the, the MDL requirements, the, the cost will be out of reach for almost everybody in New York City. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, Council Member Honey? Thank you. <clears throat> So just to get clarity on this number again, the cost to convert a basement apartment is half a million? The cost that we're seeing right now for the four remaining homes in the pilot program are above a half a million dollars. So 12 is the, the, the amount that were converted or in the process of being converted. So there were 12 homeowners that at the beginning of the pandemic 
Uh, so where that was the stage where we were doing outreach and assessments of homeowners potentially for eligibility. There were 12 that had um, gone through that screening, were eligible, and had costs on the lower end of that range that I quoted, the kind of two to $500,000 range. And knowing what we could do under a loan authority, that was a major concern for us because you know, we were working with low-income homeowners. I mean, there were, you know, some of the homeowners are moderate income, but it's overall lower income folks, right? And so um, 12, by the time the pandemic started, um, had indicated interest. We went through a financial screening with them. Cypress Hills helped us go through that process with all the homeowners to determine if they had the ability to help cover costs if we went, if the cost went above 120,000. Nobody at that point in time would have anticipated the costs associated with the MDL requirements. Of the 12, only eight filed with DOB on time. Um, there were a number of issues in there. You know, that was during the pandemic. Some folks' personal situations had changed, and so they were no longer interested. But eight did file. Um, and I think maybe you, um, you came in after I mentioned this, but um, three of them uh, subsequently dropped out because of zoning or ceiling height issues. Um, so there are five active at this point. The five, and dropped out meaning they're just not feasible under mm -hmm. current regulations, right? This is not an interest issue, this is a regulatory issue. Um, the five that remain, one is closed and is construction, four, are two unit properties converting to three units, and therefore the multiple dwelling law regulations kick in, and um, that is driving the cost up really substantially, both in terms of design, right, because you have to have an architect review this and design the building appropriately, but also the cost of actually doing the work itself. And so that was just for 12 or less because three dropped out. So. Of the initial 12, four dropped out four for dropped personal out. other reasons during the okay. pandemic. Eight filed so eight. by the On deadline time. with DOB. And of the eight, five are interested and eligible after going through this whole process. And what was the original timeline? Like, how long is a conversion supposed to take? Or what is the anticipated timeline? That's a great question. <laughs> Not this long. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the, the pilot program, right, council passed a law that authorized that owners that filed within 18 months of the effective date could receive a, basically a CFO that would, if they completed the work, allow them to legalize a basement or cellar unit. Um, we, that period was extended with the partnership of council because of the pandemic. Um, so the ultimate deadline was June of 2021, which gave eventually basically two years from the effective date to file with DOB. Um, I think but for the complexity of the pandemic, this is, would not have taken this long. Um, and now I think the issue is working through the complexity of the multiple dwelling law sure. to help these final homeowners get to where they need to be. So now what steps need to be taken at the state level um, if the state were to pass um, A9802, S8783, how many housing units could be potentially created and in, in how many years? Hmm. That's, a, that's a big question. Let me try to tackle it on a couple parts. Um, so first I would just say that we, um, we absolutely support efforts at the state level to reduce the barriers associated with creation of ADUs as well as conversion of basement or cellar units. Um, and um, I think the legislation reference, I haven't fully digested, I think the leg re uh, legislation reference was uh, legislation that we had supported last year that would have provided amnesty um, if there was an existing occupied unit. So I think one thing to note is that um, absolutely we need to be doing everything we can to provide safe housing for people that are living in spaces today. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a housing supply issue in New York City that is creating a housing crisis. And so I think that we need to think about this as both a safety issue um, and a housing supply issue, and anything we do should eliminate barriers with those two um, issues in mind. 
So then what steps are necessary to ensure tenant safety throughout the process? Were the 12 uh, or the eight um, units converted, uh, were there residents staying at the basements that were transferred or, or staying somewhere else? Could you walk us so through that? This is a tricky issue. I'm gonna be, um, I think this is important to note. HPD is an enforcement agency as well as providing incentives, right? So um, we have our community-based partner that is responsible if there are residents for worth working with them to relocate during construction period. If we know there's somebody illegally living in a property, we have potentially to vacate a building, which would create additional housing instability. So our community-based partners are the ones that are working with those residents. We do know that the some of the buildings, uh, if there's relocation necessary in order to do construction work okay. to legalize the basement or cellar. We do know based on the initial survey and home assessment information that there were a number of illegally occupied uh, basements and cellars. And were they safely relocated? If, we, if the project moved forward, they would be relocated. Okay, um, I just wanna better understand. So no one through HPD is, is being forced to vacate, but rather there's a, a community partner that you all work with to ensure to, that. To help them relocate, relocate during construction. Okay. Right, because you can't do these types of projects with people living Absolutely. in those spaces. Right, and then finally, just trying to understand, um, you know, according to the Comptroller's August 2022 report, 10% of basement units in one, two, and three family buildings face flooding risks, and this is estimated to increase to over 30% by 2050. What steps are being taken to ensure that these units are not at risk um, of flooding as storms intensify? Thank you so much. Yeah, this is so complicated. So safety is absolutely, I think, one of the utmost priorities here. And it's tricky to balance that with the need to provide more housing right, especially where you know there are illegal units. Um, as part of the pilot, we explicitly excluded coastal areas with coastal flood risk. You know, I think Ida changed our perspective on this issue to a large degree, right? We had been thinking coastal flood risk, there's also inland flood risk, and we saw the very dire consequences of not grappling with that issue. Um, I, I would say I don't know that there's a clear exact path for balancing these things, right? It may not be possible to legalize every home because you can't adequately manage or every basement or cellar because you can't adequately manage the risk. Um, that being said, um, we have um, two studies we're undertaking to try to understand this better. Um, first, we are doing, not we, HPD, but the city more generally, um, led by um, MOCEJ, is undertaking a backwater uh, valve study, um, which will hopefully ha give us a better understanding of where backwater valves can actually be impactful in managing this type of risk. Um, the other thing that we are doing, we applied for CDBG DR funds um, in order to do a basement apartment flood mitigation study to specifically understand what type of mitigation might be necessary in order to uh, reduce flood related risk in um, basement or cellar dwellings specifically. And do the costs you mentioned earlier um, include uh, flooding mitigation or climate no, because, protection? Yeah, no, they don't because we explicitly excluded properties that had a coastal flood risk. And I don't know offhand um, how much of this particular community, so this is Brooklyn Community Board 5, where there are inland flooding issues, but I don't remember that being a specific issue during the pilot program. And then finally, just when will these uh, studies be released or available to the public? Um, I believe that the backwater valve study should be complete late this year. Um, and the basement apartment flood mitigation study, we just got awarded those funds. And so I think within two years, we should have that information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Hanif. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Aviles. 
Um, so to, to follow up on what you're sharing with us about the costs. So you said uh, some of these conversions are costing between half a million and a million dollars, and that for those conversions that are now being now triggering MDL requirements, um, that 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 is doubling the cost. So what what are the other factors that are that are causing this to cost uh, $500,000? So the, the cost of doing these conversion projects, putting aside the MDL requirements, would have been, um, I mean, cost escalation has driven costs up across the board for doing renovation projects. Um, so the earlier cost information we have would have been a couple hundred thousand dollars. And we were working with homeowners to access other sources to address the gap between what we can fund under our loan authorities and the cost of the projects. Um, the MDL requirements are the requirements that have basically doubled the cost. So the range is now between half a million and a million dollars. OK, thank you. Um, so turning to a future focus, uh, what steps are required or, or what steps are do you think are necessary to safely legalize basement apartments? Right. So we've uh, we've we've seen the legislation. There are specific uh, changes that are giving the city authority to determine c appropriate ceiling heights, parking requirements, and uh, some certain MDL waivers. What are some of those details? What what is a safe ceiling height? Uh, what what are what are some of those MDL requirements? You mentioned you know changes to roofs, but what are some of the others? And uh, just to add on to that, are there any anticipated changes that need to happen through local law? Okay, I will do my best. I am not a code expert. I will just preference my response with that. Um, but based on what I've seen in the pilot program, I'll do my best to try to answer the question. So um, first and foremost. Um, so I think the requirements, the amendments that we made at the local level to the code related to ceiling height, egress, light ventilation, um, have certainly made a difference in terms of viability. Um, so certainly any program going forward, um, I see no reason at this point in time based on what we've seen to reconsider some of that, although I think we would want to engage Department of Buildings and the Fire Department and many others to make sure and certainly look at flood risk in relation to some of those issues as well. Um, I think we also, um, at the local level, have to address zoning. Um, we, the number of owners that were ineligible to participate because of zoning related requirements was very significant. Um, so um, my recollection is about a third of the properties that we had um, uh, uh, talked with had uh, coverage issues, parking issues, FAR issues, floor area issues, and so those were the most common barriers from a zoning perspective and being able to move forward. Those are gonna be issues that exist whether you're thinking about ADUs or legalization of basement or cellar units. Um, I think, so at the local level, those are two big takeaways. I would say in addition to the regulatory issues, as I mentioned, um, I, I think regulatory can sh change can reduce cost but we still need a way to support owners and actually moving forward. Um, you know, we did some kind of um, assessment of what has happened nationally around ADUs um, over the last few years. And, you know, some places has gone so far as to have like templates of how to undertake this or checklists to help owners navigate this. It's very complex work. As part of the pilot, we had community-based organizations helping, we had the city helping, we had architects involved, right? So we need to figure out a way to make it easier for normal people to actually undertake this. Um, at the state level, there are the two big things. We have a loan authority problem we have to fix. 60,000 a unit has been in statute for decades. It doesn't even help us at this point. It's a limit in just being able to help a homeowner do basic repairs certainly is not sufficient to address a conversion project. Or if we wanted to go to ADUs, wouldn't be enough to help with ADUs. Um, and then I talked about the multiple dwelling law requirements. We really need the ability for uh, those requirements to be waived. Um, you know, you could think about in, um, 
a private dwelling that is converting, that is adding another unit as an ADU instead of a multiple dwelling, right? You could come up with a different definition that would potentially exempt either in local zoning or at the state level um, those buildings from having to comply with certain requirements. Um, so again, I'm not a coal expert. I think we ultimately would need DOB, fire, lots of other people to help look at those to make sure they're addressed, certainly DCP to help us um, look at the myriad of regulations to make sure we're addressing appropriately, but those are the big issues that we have seen. And if I may, I'll just add that this is a cornerstone of our fair housing strategy. We really need the support of the council and of New Yorkers to recognize the importance of these issues in order to be able to move forward. All of, all of these steps will take that partnership. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so moving to tenant protection and, and the right to return. So the state legislation as currently written uh, includes language about a right to return. But you know, we are also, or the state would be, and with the city's uh, enablement would be conferring a, a new income source to, uh, to building, um, to house owners, right? So what, what affordability restrictions or uh, commitments would, would the administration be supportive of? To say, I think this is a really, this is a much more complex issue than it seems on face value. Um, and that's coming from somebody that finances affordable housing, right? Um, the, what we have seen is that, like, I'm today in the pilot program, we're working with lower income homeowners. Those homeowners really need additional revenue to stabilize their own households financially, right? The pilot is taking place in a community that has had much more high foreclosure risk, you know, uh, lots of issues that homeowners are facing. And so I think whatever we do to protect tenants also has to keep in mind that there are owners that may be facing their own challenges. Um, in the pilot program, we, um, we do have basically a option of the resident to return at their last rent charged, um, if there is a resident. Um, and we also have, through uh, the uh, program, financing program, um, a requirement that if the unit is vacant, there's not a returning resident, that the owner lease to a household at a rent that is affordable at or below 80% AMI. But we have an ability to waive that requirement if there is potential hardship for the homeowner itself. Um, what we've seen in our home repair programs is that many of the homeowners are highly dependent on rental income. Uh, and this is in the one to four family home space, highly dependent on rental income for their own livelihood. In fact, it sometimes is the primary source of income or one of the primary sources of income. So I think, again, to go back, I think this is much more complicated than it seems on face value. Of course, we want to protect residents, but that's not the only constituency that we want to make sure this works for in a program like this. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I think one of the one of the the pieces of feedback that we've received from some advocates is the ability to continue to have that conversation and for this council to be able to weigh in on those protections um, moving forward. So I am now going to ask DOB to read their testimony into the record, um, and then I'll glance over at my colleagues to see if they have questions, so we can uh, keep going. And actually. Um, uh, MOEC, can you read right after DOB? Okay. I'd, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Councilmember Hudson for the record and eat my brownie. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ressler. <laughs> I'll just quickly administer the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do, yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Sanchez and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I am Guillermo Patino, Deputy Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department of Buildings. I am joined today by Joseph Ackroyd, Assistant Commissioner for Technical Affairs and Code Development. We are pleased to offer testimony in support of Intro 875, 
which makes technical, technical corrections, clarifications, and modifications to certain provisions of the 2022 New York City Construction Codes. Intro 886, which extends the moratorium on the issuance of business sign violations for two additional years. And intro 150, which expands electric vehicle charge, charging readiness requirements and requires the installation of electric vehicle charging stations. The department is required to keep the construction codes up to date with the International Code Council's I-codes and began its previous construction code revision cycle in 2015. This public-private partnership, which spans several years, involved over 650 industry professionals and stakeholders who volunteered their time and sat on various committees which were organized by discipline. This code revision effort resulted in over 40,000 hours of service by committee members. Committee members included architects, engineers, attorneys, other city agencies, as well as representatives from the construction, labor, and real estate industry. The department is extremely grateful to all the committee members who volunteered their time to modernize the city's construction codes. This work resulted in the 2022 construction codes, which went into effect in November 2022. The department is supportive of Intro 875, which consists of approximately 400 amendments to the 2022 construction codes. These amendments primarily address grammatical issues and make other minor fixes. In addition, there are several changes that are more substantive in nature. These substantive changes expand on, on issues addressed in the construction codes, including eliminating the final inspection requirement for temporary construction equipment, which, which will result in cost savings for owners without impacting safety, clarifying that the uses of renewable energy credits to comply with building emissions limits are for emissions generated by the consumption of, of electricity, and allowing the department to limit the deductions allowed from renewable energy credits. Expanding the allowance for small encroachments into the public right of way when additional installation, installation is required to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Eliminating the requirement for the department to witness fire pump acceptance tests, which are conducted by qualified individuals while maintaining the ability to audit as needed. And aligning site safety plan submission requirements according to application filing date rather than the date of department approval, which allows these requirements to be consistently applied in accordance with the department's industry guidance regarding this matter. Of note, the department is already organizing a new series of committees to help draft the next set of revisions to the construction codes. Applications to join the upcoming code revision cycle will be accepted by the department through the end of this month. Extensive outreach to the industry, industry is being conducted and we encourage those who are interested in helping the department shape the future of New York City's built environment to apply. The department anticipates that it will begin submitting proposed revisions to the City Council updating the construction codes in 2024. Turning now to intro 886 regarding business signs, business signs must comply with requirements in both the New York City Building Code and the New York City Zoning Resolution. The regulations in the Building Code address permitting and structural issues, and the regulations in the Zoning Resolution address issues including permissible surface area, pr projection, and height. Collectively, these regulations exist to protect the public from dangerous or illegally installed signs and to reduce visual clutter. The department has taken the existing moratorium as an opportunity to focus on educating businesses about sign regulations and to introduce new resources to assist businesses with the process of installing signs. We have sent letters to businesses who have received violations for the, from the department for illegally installed signs in the past accompanied by information about sign regulations and the moratorium on the issuance of business sign violations, which went into effect in 2019. While educating businesses about existing regulations is critical, we believe more can be done to support businesses. Last summer, the department launched an annual no penalty business sign inspection program, which allowed businesses to request an inspection from the department to determine if their sign complies with applicable regulations by calling 311. That's a program that we uh, expect to continue moving forward as well. Uh, this type of compliance inspection incentivizes small business owners and other property owners to ensure their buildings are safe without the worry of a penalty if there's an issue that needs to be corrected. The department has also updated the resources on its website pertaining to sign installation and has simplified the sign permit process. We also recently announced the availability of dedicated resources to assist small businesses with any issues they might have, including questions pertaining to installing a sign or about any other construction project they may be, they may be pursuing. The department is fully supportive of intro 886, which will extend the moratorium on the issuance of business sign violations for two additional years. We recognize the need to continue to support small businesses and this bill does just that. We look forward to working with this committee to make it easier and more affordable for businesses to bring their signs into compliance with applicable regulations. 
Finally, the department is also supportive of the intent of intro 150, which would expand electric vehicle charging readiness requirements and requires the installation of electric vehicle charging stations. Electric vehicles present an opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to improve air quality, which is aligned with the New York City's goal of reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. This proposal builds upon existing building code requirements that require that parking lots be capable of supporting electric vehicle charging stations and goes further by requiring that electric vehicle charging stations be installed in certain instances. We look forward to working with the City Council and our partner agencies on this proposal. We thank the City Council for its continued support and look forward to continuing our work together to improve the department for the benefit of all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, Chair Sanchez and the members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Esther Brunner and I'm the Deputy Director of the Mayor's Office of Environmental Coordination. We are very pleased to offer testimony in support of Intro 876, which seeks to update the city's green building standards for city-owned and some city-funded capital projects involving buildings, as organized in Charter Section 224.1, Green Building Standards. The city's building standards were established as part of Local Law 86 in 2005 and later updated as part of Local Laws 31 and 2 of 2016. These policies place energy efficiency and lead design standards on city-funded and city-owned capital projects, ensuring that city buildings help deliver the deep carbon reductions we need to meet our ambitious climate goals. The recommended amendments as part of Intro 876 would streamline compliance, simplify the required pathways for rigorous energy reduction, align standards with the recently adopted New York City Energy Conservation Code, and align with Local Law 97 of 2019 to drastically reduce building carbon emissions, and also align with Local Law 154 of 2021 to move toward electrification for new buildings. This effort largely centers on ensuring that the reference standards cited in the charter section are updated to current iterations and can be updated to versions of such standards being released without requiring legislation. The office is supportive of Intro 876 because as the entity responsible for issuing the rules for this charter section, as well as organizing the mandated reporting regarding the outcome of compliance and reporting related to the laws, we have become familiar with some of the implementation challenges and necessary updates to support capital building teams. These proposed changes to the laws are minor and are not policy changes, but are critically needed to ensure the efficacy of the laws and improve their implementation. This legislation is needed to support the advancement of capital projects across the citywide capital portfolio by providing much needed direction and guidance to ensure sustainability goals are met within um, their development and in a way that's mutually supportive and reinforcing of recent efforts around emission and renewable energy. We thank the City Council and this committee for its continued support in advancing legislation to address the climate crisis and improve the sustainability of our building processes and the structures they create. We welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Deputy Director and Deputy Commissioner. Um, so just to, to start, and then I'm gonna turn over to Councilmember Ressler, who's been patiently waiting for, for a bit. Um, for DOB, uh, the cleanup bill includes a section on the limitation of the use of renewable energy credits that may be issued via rule. The department lists three factors that it will consider in issuing this rule. So regarding those factors, first, how will or does DOB determine the availability or expected availability of renewable energy credits? Second, how does DOB currently approach environmental justice? What is the definition that DOB is contemplating? And third, who would uh, complete the environmental justice assessment? Would DOB consult with experts and stakeholders? And if yes, which ones? Thank you. Uh, so first I'll start uh, by mentioning that last month was a significant month in terms of Local Law 97 implementation. Uh, so the department uh, issued the advisory board report. Uh, so the department has been uh, working with stakeholders very closely for the past several years and over 300 meetings were, were held as part of that process. 
So the report we issued last month includes the recommendations that came out of that advisory board process. Uh, so we're very thankful for all the advisory board members that participated in that process. Uh, and then secondly, I'll mention that last month we also finalized our first major local law 97 rule. And that rule did take a significant step forward as it relates to renewable energy credits or RECs. And it specified that RECs can only be used to offset electricity emissions and not for em emissions produced on site, for example, from oil or gas boilers. And we believe this is a very fair approach and it's in line with how the state and the federal government approach RECs. Uh, but we believe that our our ability to make future determinations around the use of RECs can be made clearer. So that's why we included language in the cleanup bill that you mentioned, uh, intro 875, that, just, that does just that. The bill allows us to, to make further determinations around the use of RECs. And we're gonna be doing that uh, by rule. So the rule will also be a public process. There will be a public hearing for that rule. And we're approaching this issue very carefully. We appreciate that it's a significant issue, both for stakeholders, the advocate community, and for the building owners who need to comply with Local Law 97. So we're gonna take a very careful approach, and right now we've engaged NYSERDA to study this issue. Uh, so we're, we're talking to NYSERDA both to, to better understand the Rex market, how the Rex market will operate, and how Rex will impact Local Law 97 compliance. So we're currently engaged with NYSERDA as part of that process. Okay, before you turn to the environmental justice question, um, just wanted to do a quick follow-up. So the controller's office produced a report in December on Local Law 97, uh, modeling different rec, rec limit scenarios, so 10, 30% and 50%. Uh, they, the office outlined the impacts of various rec C limits um, on the overall targeted emission reductions. So I understand uh, the limitation for electrification, but what about uh, limiting how much of an o the overall reduction required by a building, um, limiting how much of that is able to be offset via Rexies. That's something we're studying right now, uh, along with our partners at NYSERDA, to better understand the market and how Rex will Im impact the implementation of Local on 97 So that's why we're not putting forward uh, a, a limit certain in the bill before you today. We're just clarifying that the department has the ability to limit Rex further, and, and our plan is to do that by rule. And we certainly look forward to engaging the city council as part of that process as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so moving to the environmental justice factor, um, who will be con who would be completing the environmental justice impact assessment? Will DOB consult experts and stakeholders? If so, which ones? Um, and what exactly do you envision that the impact assessment would entail? That's something we're currently studying as well with our partners at NYSERDA, so we'll have more updates for you on that front as well. Okay, and then the third factor is a catch-all. Any other relevant factor determined to be related to the use of or restriction on the use of such credits? I'm a little troubled by the lack of specificity here. What are other relevant factors that DOB could consider? And that's, that's also something we're currently looking at. So right now we're still studying this, this issue with uh, NYSERDA. And uh, you know, once, once we conclude those, that study and those conversations, we'll be looking to promulgate rules around this issue. So, so we're, cer we're certainly gonna be sharing more information with you on, on this issue moving forward. Great, thank you. And, and as you know, uh, this council, myself, we're laser focused on making sure that the environmental benefits of Local Law 97 are not eroded in any way. And so we're, we're very vigilant about any discussion about renewable energy credits. Thank you, we appreciate that and completely agree. Of course. Uh, Council Member Ressler. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chair Sanchez. Uh, we are really fortunate to have you leading and in this role, uh, serving as the chair of this vital committee. I also want to just echo your congratulations to Kim on your appointment as deputy commissioner. It's good to see you. Um, we're well. We're fortunate as a city to have you in that role, Deputy Commissioner Darga. And I also just want to thank Guillermo, who is incredibly responsive and helpful. I imagine that like every other council member in the city of New York, we have DOB related crises at the most random hours of the night and on weekends. And I am deeply appreciative of your help in addressing issues in real time in our community. Um, thank you for going above and beyond. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, kind of echo some of the points that uh, Chair Sanchez was making uh, as it relates to uh, Intro 875, uh, this code bill. Uh, so 
just firstly want to underscore again, at this point, um, DOB has no specific uh, percentage in mind for a cap that you would put on RECs. There's no analysis that's been conducted internally to inform what cap you would plan to impose. So not at this time. Uh, we don't have a, a limit that we would propose at this time. So we're, we're really committed to, to looking at this issue carefully. Uh, you know, the, this, this administration has taken a very careful approach to the implementation of Local Law 97. DOB has established a sustainable, sustainability bureau, which is led by Laura Popa, and she's fully committed to this issue as well. So we're, we're taking a very careful approach to this, and, and our goal is to study this issue carefully and then to come, to come forward I, with I recommendations. I really appreciate that, Deputy elements. Commissioner. Careful is important, but so is speed, and we have no time to waste. And so should the council move forward on this code bill, uh, what would be the timeline for DOB getting these rules implemented? So we anticipate doing a lot of rulemaking around Local Law 97 this year. So emissions limits begin in 2024, and then owners begin reporting their compliance to the Department of Buildings in 2025. So we fully appreciate how important it is for owners to have guidance around this issue and for the advocate community who's really, you know, focused on this issue as well. Uh, so we're, we're You're not prepared to give any timeline specificity beyond this calendar year? So regarding the RECs market, we don't expect Tier 4 RECs to be available until 2027 but we know that owners who need to comply with this law need information a lot earlier than that. So we're fully focused on this issue. And we'll certainly provide you with a, a more firm time, timeline when we have one. But did I hear you correctly that you would plan on getting these rules, having a hearing on these rules this calendar year? So the bulk of our local I-97 rulemaking will happen this year, but rulemaking around the Rex issue specifically, the timeline still remains to be seen and that's gonna our, our conversation when I started will definitely inform that. But and, and is it, I don't know if you're a lawyer, but is it the perspective of DOB that this legislation is essential in order to pass further rules relating to RECs and to impose further caps? We do believe that our ability to make future determinations on the issue of RECs and to place a cap on, on RECs, uh, that we would need this legislation, yes. And then one final question, then I'll make a comment, if that's okay. Um, as of reports late last year, uh, DOB had the highest rate of vacancy of any rate in the city. And uh, the work of DOB inspectors and the enforcement work you all do uh, is essential to our collective safety. I am deeply concerned about the dramatic reduction in headcount that we're experiencing across all of city government. And you're all under oath, so you have to be honest with me. I know you are too. Um, <laughs> Uh, you smile there. I appreciate you guys. Um, but, uh, but in all seriousness, the City Hall folks were, were not smiling, in case you could tell, couldn't tell. Um, but in all seriousness, is DOB able to, how are the vacancies at DOB impacting your ability to swiftly implement Local Law 97? Thank you. Uh, so we're definitely hiring, uh, hiring for the Sustainability Bureau, which was recently established. And the way that uh, you know we we plan to implement local law 97, we needed a smaller team to begin with, and our plan is for that team to definitely grow as the law you know continues to be implemented. We can definitely update you on those hiring efforts as well. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, I appreciate your responses, I, and I appreciate the thoughtfulness with regard that you're trying to bring to local law 97, and that I know Deputy Commissioner Popa is trying to bring as well. I just have to underscore. It's not just thoughtfulness, it's also speed. And we need to move aggressively and swiftly to limit wrecks. The loopholes that we have right now are wholly unacceptable. And if DOB does not act appropriately, then I certainly believe the council must. And so if you all are unable to resolve this in rulemaking, either, uh, if you are all unable to resolve this in rulemaking, then we should push through aggressive legislation uh, to place those requirements, uh, to impose those requirements ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Ressler. So following up on, on the same issue, you mentioned this. So DOB is currently working on a rec, I don't know, I keep saying rec, Rexy. Okay, but uh, a renewable energy credit limit study with NYSERDA. What's the timeline for the completion of this study? 
So we don't have a timeline for completing the study at this time, but we'll certainly update you on this issue moving forward. Uh, but again, we would have to promulgate rules in order to further limit the use of RECs. When did the study begin? So we're, we're engaging NYSER in those conversations currently. So it hasn't started? You're in discussions? No, we've already began discussing this issue with NYSER. I can get back to you with the specific date in which we, we began engaging them. Uh, so I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Okay. Uh, will you be releasing, with the, will the city be releasing the modeling analysis to the public? I'll get back to you on that as well. Okay. And any sense of what the next steps would be once the study is completed? Then we would have to work on drafting a rule in order to limit RECs further, and that's a public process as well. So there will be a, a public he hearing as part of that process, and then after the hearing, we would have to move to promulgate a final rule. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any colleagues? Okay. Thank you. Um, Okay, so then the, the next question is on intro 876. Uh, for the sake of the public, can you please walk us through the provisions of this bill and how uh, this bill will change the existing green buildings law? Thank you, um, Chair Sanchez, for your question. Um, so this charter section, again, is comprised of the original law from 2005 and then amendments from 2013. And basically, um, it provides two different tracks of green building standards and implementation applicable to the city's own buildings and a very, very small universe of co-funded, city co-funded buildings. And the two tracks are one for um, larger um, projects that they have to be built to lead green building standards. So lead gold for certain occupancy groups and just um, lead um, certified for others. And then the second track is if city buildings do systems replacements. Um, there again, there is a certain monetary threshold which um, if reached, the law kicks in. And that is true for the lead threshold as well. There actually it matters what the construction cost um, of a city project will be. Um, there are different ranges, um, and depending on in which range um, a project falls, it has to um, certify to certain levels and or also um, um, fulfill additional energy um, cost savings requirements. So the idea overall is that the city leads by example. <laughs> that was the original idea in 2005 um, with sustainable and green building. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so the bill is currently drafted, grants the mayor the authority to allow alternative standards to be adopted for certain occupancy groups. Specifically, the legislation allows for less stringent alternative standards to be adopted for uh, these occupancy groups. So can you explain why this waiver is necessary? Is there a way for occupancy groups, those occupancy groups to meet the same or at least equally stringent standards as other buildings? Yeah, so I think the original idea, right, um, and so, sorry, the, the, um, the, the proposed amendments in today's cleanup bill, right, um, we're not making any changes to, to mayoral authorities, so that is an original provision from the 2005 um, bill. And so the idea, I think, at that point was um, we were in an entirely different environment um, in terms of green building. Um, at the time, a lot of city agencies um, were very concerned about how they will implement uh, those provisions. And um, that also um, led to an exemption provision that our office is authorized to grant under certain conditions. And so one is, um, just to give you an example, with the um, mayoral authority to allow for a different standard and lead, um, that made a lot of sense, for example, for the SDA at the time, the school's construction authority, because there was no lead specific framework for school buildings. So this is a very unique type of building where um, they, they were just not able to meet the, the regular residential or commercial frameworks on their lead. So they were um, allowed to develop their own green building um, schools guide. And a, a similar example is um, 
the most recent one we have worked on was uh, an application or request from the Department of Environmental Protection asking to use an industrial green building standard, which is envisioned because they have so many assets where, where there are none, uh, where there are no humanly, human occupied spaces like pump stations or um, certain storage spaces where people do not work, right? So they can be unheated and not lit and where they don't have the same types of energy um, demand as other buildings have that, are, that include offices or locker rooms, for example. So that, I think, is the initial intent um, with allowing for alternative standards under very specific conditions and for only very specific um, occupancy groups. And yes, there may be the necessity to, to go to a less stringent level um, than otherwise would be required if you go for um, a LEED certified or LEED gold certified level. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, Okay, and so last set of questions from me and looking over to colleagues if, if y'all have any additional questions. Um, but with respect to intro 886, glad to hear the administration is supportive of this and, and looking forward to working on, on um, you know, making sure that our small businesses are not penalized. So how many does DOB have this estimate? How many non-compliant signs remain in the city of New York? So we don't have that estimate, but I can look into this issue further and see what information we can pull. Perhaps we can uh, look into how many violations we issued for illegally installed signs in the past and, and try to gauge that. But we have seen consistently you know, an, an uptick in the number of sign permits that have been pulled since the moratorium has been in place, which is promising. Okay, thank you. And, and just looking backwards, uh, prior to the current moratorium in 2016 and 2017, DOB received about 1,000 such complaints, resulting in 800 inspections and about 500 violations. If the city council does not enact this proposed legislation, what happens to the businesses that have not been able to correct their signs? They would potentially be on the hook for violations should we receive a complaint. So we're not proactively enforcing this requirement. So what happened uh, pre-moratorium was that we were receiving complaints and in 2018, there was a significant uptick in complaints. So we were obligated to respond to every complaint we receive. So potentially they could receive violations. Uh, but I will note, uh, as part of the mayor's executive order to small business forward, uh, one proposal that DOB did put forward is that we're no longer gonna be imposing $6,000 work without a permit penalties on small businesses. Uh, so the regulatory uh, framework is certainly much more improved than it was in 2018 for businesses. And we've also extended the time period that a business has to correct violations. So should they receive a violation once the moratorium does end, they will no longer be on the hook for a $6,000 work without a permit penalties, and they'll also have more time to correct. Got it. Thank you. And then according to the latest information that we have, there are only 25 special sign hangers who are licensed to do the remediation work required here. Uh, this is a very limited pool of workers for a lot of businesses in the city of New York. Um, so what are some, what, some ideas that the, the department has considered to increase the number of workers that are allowed to do sign hanging? So as part of uh, the original uh, law that put into place the moratorium, we were tasked with establishing a task force to explore this issue. And one of the ideas that came out of this task force was allowing other, other folks to also be able to install signs. One of the proposals was perhaps allowing general contractors to install smaller signs. Uh, so that was one idea that came out of that task force, which would certainly open up the, the pool of individuals who could hang signs. Great. Thank you so much. And actually, just uh, one question on intro 150. Um, are there currently any incentive programs available for the city to uh, level the playing field for EV supply equipment installation? I'm not aware of any offhand, but, but we'll look into this and get back to you. Okay. We, have to, we have to do more uh, because private owners are not necessarily going to allow this. Okay. Do you want to acknowledge Councilmember Aviles? Thank you so much, Chair Sanchez. Um, I have a couple of questions across um, all the pieces of legislation, but since we last um, were 
talking about. Um, 150 in terms of the, the charging stations. Does this include uh, charging for e-bikes? Or are we specifically just talking about cars? This would just be specifically for, for vehicles, so not, not e-bikes. Yeah. Is the city uh, recognizing the significant increase in the usage of cars and the need for that infrastructure? And what would that look like? As I, I'm sorry, the, the significant in, increase for um, e-bikes and e-bike usage and the, re, and the need for infrastru charging infrastructure that is public outside of people's homes as it relates to all the safety issues. Have you been considering that um, in terms of um, expanding the infrastructure? That's a really good point, Council Member. So we're certainly supportive of the intent of this bill, but I think we, we definitely want to discuss the technical requirements in the bill and whether the percentages for EV charging readiness and the actual installation of EV chargers are appropriate. So I think we should certainly discuss that issue as part of that conversation as well. That's great. Uh, we've written to the federal government around the need for this and particularly the integration of e-bikes um, and that specific consideration so we don't go so far down as to build an infrastructure that then we have to adopt, which we know is significantly more expensive in the end. Um, so I implore you to include e-bikes into that um, consideration across the city. Um, in terms of... Uh, in terms of local law 97, could you repeat um, what the rule you mentioned um, that I guess the group uh, the group finalized one specific rule? Could could you repeat what that was again? Yeah. In terms of the recs? Yeah, of course. So last month we finalized our first major local law 97 rule. Mm -hmm. And what that rule does is that it, ex it explains to, to building owners how they, have, how they can calculate their, their building emissions for the purposes of complying with the law, how they're, they're going to be submitting those uh, emissions to the department uh, for review in, 2020, 20, in 2025 in terms of how they're, they're complying with the law. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, the, the last thing that I mentioned is that we also took a step forward on the issue of RECs, and we're limiting deductions from RECs to just electricity uses within a building. So not, not uh, emissions produced on site, for example, through oil or gas boilers. So we did limit the use of RECs to, to just electricity in, in that rule that we finalized in December. Got it, thank you, thank you so much. Um, in, I just have to underscore uh, my colleague, council member um, Lincoln Ressler's call for urgency and in, in speed. Um, uh, I think what we heard here today, obviously, is that there is a lot of rulemaking that needs to happen that will s happen this year, but a very kind of dot, dot, dot in terms of the wrapping up of the, the study and in terms of like really moving forward with the RECs. I think um, time is not our, on our side with climate change, and while we need to move thoughtfully, we do need to move with urgency. Um, because the loopholes are quite significant. So I just, you know, uh, I have to underscore that. I, I think we feel very urgent uh, around this issue to make sure we close those loopholes and not linger on for, for quite a long time. Um, in terms of, uh, I think I forgot my last question. I may have to turn it over to the chair and then I'll maybe remember. Thank you. No, no problem. Um, okay, HPD, one, one last question that I have for you. Um, you talked a little bit about your existing loan authority and the need for Affordability Plus. So can you, can you just specifically uh, describe what changes you would be seeking through Affordability Plus to enable um, uh, more conversions? Absolutely. Um, so most of HPD's loan authorities, um, which are granted through the state, are decades old. With regard to ADUs and conversions, there are a couple issues. One, the statute that we use to provide assistance to one to four family homes uh, caps the level of assistance at $60,000 per dwelling unit. So one family converting to a two family, the maximum loan would be $120,000. For a two-family converting to a three-family, the maximum loan would be $180,000. Uh, 
Um, even if HPD wanted to provide more assistance, we could not. Um, so that's issue one. Issue two, because most of the loan authorities that we have, including the loan authority for one to four family homes, dates back decades, the primary issue um, that um, the public purpose that we are achieving through making a loan is primarily related to addressing blight, uh, which makes sense if you think of the era in which these loan authorities were created. Um, we are looking for more flexibility under our loan authorities to address myriad housing issues, including resiliency, conversions, um, a number of housing issues that property owners are dealing with today. So those are the two big issues that we need to address uh, with regard to conversions or ADUs. There's a whole slew of other issues when we're talking about housing more generally. Well, thank you so much, uh, HPD, DOB, MOEC, members of the administration, for, for taking my gratitude, but I have a council member who's remembered her question. <laughs> I just remembered. Thank you, thank you. I'm so sorry you want to wrap up. I know. Um, it, was, it was actually for HPD, um, particularly around the, you mentioned the study around the back water valves. Um, is that specifically relegated to their impact um, for potential ADUs, or is that kind of general usage? Um, uh, I will speak about what I know, but okay. maybe some of my colleagues know more. Um, so the backwater valve study specifically was something that we uh, wanted to do after Ida because of uh, inland flooding related issues to understand the effectiveness of using backwater valves to manage the risk uh, in terms of geography and other issues, so. Got it, okay. Um, great, I, I, I represent District 38 in South Brooklyn and certainly experience qu quite a lot of um, <clears throat> flooding anytime we have rain, so th this has been a, a intervention that um, I think we have heard a lot of mixed reviews about. Some homeowners say, it's great, and others are like, that's the greatest waste of money and time, and I'm utterly frustrated. So I think we definitely have to figure out um, how, to, how to support our homeowners and, and bring relief for this, on this issue. In terms of the, um, I was curious if the learnings around the ADUs, obviously we're trying to correct a housing stock that is varied and, and quite old in many ways. Um, have we updated, uh, I guess, regulations around how new structures are when they're being built so that they don't have some of these issues that we're seeing with older stock that was built during different times and under different regulations in terms of like what an accessory dwelling unit could look like? I don't know that I can adequately answer that question. Um, I think uh, certainly from a zoning perspective, there are substantial limitations. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll, I'm gonna do my best in answering, but I might need some help from, from others uh, or we may have to circle back. Um, the zoning regulations certainly do substantially constrain what can be built today. Uh, and that impacts both ADUs as well as conversion projects. Um, and that is because of coverage requirements um, as well as floor area ratios, unit limits, parking requirements, a whole slew of issues. Mm. Um, in addition to that, I, within building code, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if my colleague is prepared to talk about that. If not, we can get back to you. Yeah, I, I guess I was curious. I'm sure much has evolved since many of those decades, and maybe some of this is, is moot, but maybe some of it is not, and we continue to kind of um, perpetuate some things that are going to need to be addressed in, in the future. So thank you. I'll, I'll just add on that. So some of this that we've been talking about is legalizing basements, and that's where you will find some of uh, our, our work dealing with existing structures. But as we've talked about off and on today, some of this is about creating the space to build new accessory dwelling units. And so while that might be about um, new housing that we're constructing generally, it might not, it might be totally unrelated, but not have the same constraints as basements. 
And as we mentioned, zoning can be a, an issue for that as well. We do see this as a really important part of both uh, combating the housing supply crisis that we're struggling with here in the city, um, the lack of uh, accessible, um, low-cost options for New Yorkers, and New Yorkers should be able to choose uh, the neighborhood that works best for them. So this is also a really important fair housing consideration for us, and one of the reasons why we're so committed um, both to ADUs, to the creation of new ADUs, and to legalizing basements. Great, thank you so much. And one last question, Chair, for um, DOB. In, in terms of the, um, the, I'm not sure if I'm uh, calling it the right thing, but in terms of the moratorium around the fine for, I guess, uh, not having the sign, the $6,000 fine, which is what I know it about, I, I know it as in community with having quite a number of residents who have been fined the $6,000 fee. Did that, is that moratorium uh, retroactive to a certain date or is that a moratorium that is moving or a waiving of that fee moving forward? So it applied to, uh, I believe, violations issued after 2019. So nothing after before 2019. 2019, right. Interesting, okay, thank you. You're welcome. But, but it also applied moving forward because uh, we, we amended our regulations to do away with that fine altogether for small businesses. That's great. I, yeah. I'd love to, in the future, need to talk a little bit more about the, that entire process um, and the burden uh, of how the violations are put forward and residents who have been told they have to pay the violations, whether or not they plead guilty first. And then it sounds like a very... Um, a logical process in many ways, so I'd love to talk some more offline. Of course, thank you. All right, I'd also like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Dinowitz, and with that, for real this time, uh, thank you to the administration for your testimony today. Please, uh, you know, consider us partners in the conversations around legalizing basements. There's a lot of uh, priorities that we want to meet, the affordability, the tenant protections, but also the homeowner benefits, um, and everything in between. So thank you for, for the discussion, and we look forward to aging these bills together. Thank you. We will now turn to testimony from uh, participants from the public. Uh, please listen for your name to be called, whether you are here in person or joining via Zoom. If you're joining via Zoom, when it is your turn to testify, you will be prompted to unmute. Please accept the prompt uh, and begin your testimony. In the interest of time, public testimony will be limited to two minutes per person. We will begin with Moses Gates, Jishian Ravintheran, Sylvia Morse, Ryan Chavez and Catherine Leach. If you're here in person, you may come up to the witness table. Thank you, Mr. Gates, if you're ready, you may begin. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, uh, Chair Sanchez and City Council. I wanted to quickly address the uh, ADU issue and how we can really help address our housing crisis through better uh, incentives and better framework for accessory dwelling units. There's really two different regulatory issues that we need to address. The first one is the zoning issue, and that's what I wanted to spend most, most of my time on. Without the proper zoning, as you heard from HPD, there's no way to really move forward with any legalization of accessory dwelling units in many of our areas. Um, if you do have the proper zoning, there are still many hurdles to overcome, as you also heard the expense through the multiple dwelling law, um, a state law that only applies to New York City and was put in place before our uh, existing building code was put in place. Um, I might add. Um, so that provides a lot of constraints, uh, as does um, some other building code issues and, of course, the, the financing and the financial environment that we find ourselves under. Um, with zoning, the first thing I always want to point out is New York City. In New York City, only about 10 percent of the housing stock consists of single-family homes, but they take up 40 percent of the residential land. 
Uh, and between single family and two family homes, they take up two thirds of the residential land here in New York City. And this is not only in places like the south shore of Staten Island or far eastern Queens. There's many, many places zoned for exclusively single family use that are closer into the center of the city, very subway accessible, and areas that really have the existing infrastructure to accommodate more, uh, more residents through uh, one to two family conversions and through uh, accessory dwelling units. And you would think that we would be incentivizing this, but instead we've gone the opposite way. Over the last uh, 20 years, we've actually have 10,000 more parcels zoned for single family home use than we did in 2002. So we're going the opposite way. We believe that at Regional Plan Association that we could add about 100,000 units through just the better zoning incentives and reducing some of those MDL requirements for accessory dwelling units, many of which, as I pointed out, would be in these transit accessible locations um, near, uh, near jobs, near transit, near the subway. Um, that's based on one third of uh, the, possibility, the possible universe that could be created through these reforms. And as you heard from HPD, with about 40% uptake in East New York, um, that's something you know, we think is, is well within the, uh, the realm of feasibility. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, we've actually been joined by the bill sponsor in Albany, uh, Harvey Epstein, Assembly Member Harvey Epstein. So if, you, if panel wouldn't mind to hold for a second so we can hear from Assembly Member Epstein. Thank you, Council Member. I'm sorry to, to interrupt your proceedings. I really do appreciate you taking the time to let me speak. You know, we're up here in Albany, and so I appreciate you allowing me to do that remotely. First of all, thank you for holding this committee on basement apartments. You know, estimates say that there's at least 115,000 basement apartments in New York City. Chai and Pratt Center say there's closer to three to 500,000 units. Honestly, during law school, when I lived in Flushing, Queens, I lived in one. And so basement apartments play a critical role in our housing stock, and we need to make sure that they're regulated and safe units. So we all know about a year and a half ago, we lost 11 New Yorkers who were living in basement apartments after Hurricane Ida flooded their units. We can do better. We can protect those New Yorkers. Tragedies like those are avoidable. If we recognize the existence of basement apartments and create pathways to legalize it. And that's what this resolution does. And that's what my bill in Albany does as well. You know, the, the bill, which is subject to the state legislative, uh, the resolution before you, creates a pathway to legalization and creates multiple opportunities to waive issues like the multiple dwelling law, which now prevents some of those units from becoming uh, legal. It's not about safety, it's just kind of legislative problems that we need to overcome. Tens of thousands of New Yorkers could benefit from a safe and affordable apartment, as long as the city council and the state legislature work together to pass this legislation. Luckily, uh, Kath Governor Kathy Hochul just two weeks ago talked about support for uh, basement legalization, and we've heard from Mayor Adams, who's also been supportive, it's really important to know that you know, we have an affordable housing crisis with 60,000 homeless New Yorkers every day, people living in homeless shelters, being, seeing migrants coming to New York and having no place to live. This can create a, a one facet of the affordable units that we need around our city. I look forward to working with the city council to pass this resolution, and then we'll be able to move forward and pass this statewide. It's a critical moment in New York when we have to decide with our priorities what we're going to do. We need to stand with New Yorkers who are the most vulnerable who are living in those basement apartments and ensure that this resolution gets passed and we have create a pathway to legalization for all those families that are living in, in basement units. Thank you again for letting me take a moment to speak and I encourage all my colleagues in the council to support this resolution. Thank you so much, Assembly Member, to you and to Senator Kavanaugh for championing this in Albany. Appreciate you. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Sanchez and members of the committee. Um, my name is Jashan Ravintharan, pronouns he, him, and I am very happy to be here on behalf of the Legal Aid Society. Uh, many of our clients are 
are particularly immigrants and people of color who live in the basement units at the heart of this resolution, which seeks to support the state legislative proposal A1075, allowing the city to establish a program to safely legalize these units. We believe A1075 is a step forward for ensuring tenants have a right to live somewhere with security, peace, and dignity. And to name just one example of how much of a beneficial impact this could have, in one of my cases, the ceiling collapsed on a client and her three-year-old daughter. Um, however, our concern is it only guarantees tenants an option to return to the unit after necessary alterations. Since these apartments are unregulated, there's nothing to stop a landlord from giving tenants their right to return, but also hiking the price of these units or even terminating their unregulated tenancy as currently allowed by law to make them leave. This is common now and will get worse as landlords seek to justify rent increases based on these alterations. And for example, in that same case, the landlord had tried to hike the rent from $1,000 a month to $1,700 a month. Uh, we would hope that this committee and the council collaborate with their colleagues in Albany to provide for good cause eviction protections in these basement units um, to ensure that they aren't subject to these type of rent increases and also um, have a right to a lease renewal. And this is particularly important because the state legislative proposal exempts um, certain owner-occupied buildings that these basement units are typically a part of. And lastly, uh, there's nothing in the bill currently that addresses the displacement of tenants. And in that case, for example, I don't know what I would have told a single mother and her two minor kids to go while these renovations were being made. Um, so we thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for that. And just a, a quick follow up. Um, is it your is it Legal Aid Society's position that these amendments should be made in the state legislation or enable uh, the council to make the changes? Yes, we believe it should be in the state legislation because they would need to provide the authority to the city council to provide for those good cause eviction protections. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move to Sylvia Morse, Ryan Chavez, and Catherine Leach. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair Sanchez and members of the committee. Thank you for holding this hearing on the urgent issue of basement legalization. I'm Sylvia Morse, Policy Program Manager at the Pratt Center for Community Development, which has been working on basement apartment safety for 15 years with the BASE Coalition. Basement apartments are a critical part of the city's low-income housing stock, home to tens of thousands of New Yorkers. Pratt Center found that unaccounted for units are concentrated in community districts that are majority people of color and where rent burden and poverty rates are higher than citywide. Amidst our city's housing affordability crisis, many low-income New Yorkers will continue to rely on basement apartments. Yet, because this housing is unregulated, residents lack basic tenant protections and may be living in unsafe conditions in the event of fire or floods and increasing risk citywide, as tragically shown by the deaths of 11 New Yorkers during Hurricane Ida uh, living in basements. To make basement apartments safe, they must be legalized. The most crucial next step is amending the state's multiple dwelling law, or MDL, as discussed uh, often today, to allow New York City to create a basement legalization program. As proposed in the bill uh, introduced in Albany last year and echoed in Governor Hochul's housing compact. Under current law, two and three fa family small homes adding a basement unit would be subject to MDL. A key learning from the East New York pilot program is that the MDL adds significant regulatory complexity and, most importantly, prohibitive six-figure increases to conversion costs. Pratt Center found that half of the city's potentially convertible basements and cellars are in two- and three-family homes, which would be effectively excluded from a basement conversion program absent state reform. We urge this committee and city council to pass Resolution 161 in support of an amendment to the New York's multiple dwelling law. At the city level, we will need to enact zoning changes, including allowing accessory dwelling units, amending parking requirements, and addressing how seller conversions are accounted for in FAR calculations. While we're encouraged to see that the city has signaled support for these zoning text amendments, they're not expected to go through ULERP until 2024. City Council will play a key role Your in the public's expired. understanding of the necessity of zoning changes for basement conversions as a housing justice issue, and ultimately in the approval of these reforms. Um, and I'll be submitting full testimony in writing. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much, and thanks to Pratt Center for leading on this issue for 15 years. 
Thank you. Ryan Chavez, followed by Catherine Leach. Good Maybe. afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Good afternoon, Chair Sanchez and members of the committee. My name is Ryan Chavez, Director of the Basement Apartment Conversion Pilot Program at Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation. Founded in 1983, Cypress is a nonprofit community development organization and settlement house based in East New York. We are also members of the Base Coalition. As you know, four years ago, New York City, in partnership with Cypress, launched the East New York Basement Conversion Pilot. Through our ongoing work on this pilot, we have found that under current codes, it is extraordinarily difficult to bring most basement apartments into compliance. This is due to several different regulatory barriers. In some cases, these barriers make it legally impossible to add a new unit. Minimum parking requirements is one example of this, and this is a barrier that the city has the power to lower. In other cases, the barrier is not legally prohibitive, but rather makes the conversion financially infeasible. The state's multiple dwelling law, or MDL, is one example of this. When a two-family home wants to add a basement unit, this forces the homeowner to comply with the MDL for the first time. And it's not just the basement that needs to comply, the entire building must be brought into compliance up to the rooftop. This is astronomically expensive and generally has nothing to do with making the basement space safe. So you may see reports regarding high construction costs in the East New York pilot. This is largely due to the rules on the books now for basement apartments. High construction costs are a policy decision and we need our policymakers to make modest reforms, particularly at the state level, to help lower these costs. As such, we strongly support state legislation that would make these reforms and urge the city council to support this as well. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment and I'll be submitting further comments in written form. Great. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, we'll now turn to Catherine Leach followed by Warren Schreiber and Jacqueline Crawley. You may begin. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me adequately? Yes. Great. My name is Kate Leach. I am a senior policy analyst at the Citizens Housing and Planning Council. Uh, CHPC has spent over a decade researching basement conversions, and we are the program evaluator for the East New York pilot. In all facets of our work, we have seen that the snarl of city and state regulations make it either financially or physically infeasible for homeowners to bring their basement apartments into compliance. The city must streamline a path to legalization that ensures that critical safety standards like emergency egress are met. But without state action, the city can only improve conditions in single family homes. And this is because two family homes or multiple dwellings uh, that add a basement apartment are duly regulated by both city and state. Overlapping city and state regulations make administrative and, uh, excuse me, administration and compliance more costly and more difficult. It also makes amending and refining a basement legalization program needlessly complex. Uh, this is the central reason why government has not yet acted to address this urgent issue. Additionally, the expertise on these issues resides locally within the city agencies that administer the regulations, including the MDL, and with the nonprofits and community groups that have spent years navigating the complexities of basement legalization. By giving the city authority to provide relief from the MDL, the state would enable the city to assert its own uh, rigorous building and occupancy standards in circumstances that are endemic to the city. We urge City Council to pass Resolution 161, uh, calling on the state to cut through a layer of unnecessary regulation uh, and to empower the city to meet its own needs. Thank you. Uh, we are also submitting written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Warren Schreiber, followed by Jacqueline Crawley and Aliyah Sumro. You may begin. Uh, it appears Mr. Schreiber is not present. We'll move to Jacqueline Crawley. Jacqueline Crawley is also not currently present, so we will move to Aliyah Sumro. 
sorry, RPA, before you leave, uh, this is a question for any, any of the, the previous panelists. Um, but in terms of changes or um, amending the MDL, are, we, are you all uh, advocating or what are you uniquely advocating to change in particular? Is it let's create a new category for accessory dwelling units or is it particular uh, components of the MDL? Uh, I will I, I will let others answer this question too because I think we all might have slightly different answers. I would say the biggest the the largest exemption that could be made in the MDL is exempting the two family homes that convert to three family homes uh, through in a, through a basement apartment or otherwise to exempt them. I would say most necessarily from bringing the entire building up to MDL standards and codes, um, but also to exempt the basement apartment to essentially treat it as a one family to two family conversion under the multiple dwelling law. On a numbers perspective, that would, that would be the uh, most valuable in being able to scale up uh, any conversion programs without incurring that additional cost, but I think other organizations will will probably have a more nuanced so some more nuanced answers of this. Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to add anything? Uh, if any of the panelists that were joining via Zoom have a response to the question, just use the Zoom raise hand function, and you will receive a prompt to unmute. I think we understand that there's a very large snarl of regulations here that need to be streamlined. One of the things we would caution the city council is, I believe in previous iterations of the state bill, they were thinking of eliminating a second egress requirement. Um, we're definitely not building experts at the Legal Aid Society, but we are hoping that the committee prioritizes tenant safety as they streamline these um, processes. Great, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will now move to Aliyah Sumro, followed by Shravanti Conical and Ma April MacGyver. Can I go? Good afternoon. My name is Aliyah Sumro, and I'm the Deputy Director for New York City Policy at the New York League of Conservation Voters. Thank you, Chair Sanchez and members of the Housing and Buildings Committee for the opportunity to testify today. One of NYLCV's top policy goals is moving New Yorkers away from fossil fuel powered vehicles to fight climate change and improve the city's air quality. Fossil fuel powered vehicles damage our public health by emitting harmful pollutants, most often concentrating air pollution in low income and communities of color due to historic environmental racism in the siting of toxic waste facilities and our country's historic highway construction. NYLCV supports the passes supports the passage of Intro 150, sponsored by Councilmember Justin Brannon, which would require that 40% of all parking spaces in existing garages and open lots be capable of supporting EV charging stations by 2030. Expanding EV charging infrastructure is vital as the city strives to meet the state's emissions reduction goals set out in the CLCPA. As our power grid switches to renewable energy, such as solar, wind, and hydropower, EVs will become an even cleaner way to get around as they have a much smaller carbon footprint on average than conventional cars. While we recognize that EVs are not the sole solution to fighting climate change, it is one tool in our mitigation toolbox. Prioritizing EV charging infrastructure in existing parking lots, along with policies that invest in our public transportation system, make our streets safer and more pedestrian friendly, and encourage alternative modes of transportation are key to making our city more equitable. We look forward to working with the city council and city agencies to move this bill forward. This legislation was included in our 2021 city council environmental scorecard and will be included in our 2022 scorecard. We urge you to prioritize intro 150 and vote yes when the bill comes up to a vote. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you. Before moving to the next panelist, we're going to return to Catherine Leach who had a response to the chair's previous question. I just wanted to add that uh, we think that the proposed legislation would be a great success, but we do hope that the state, the state provides enough latitude for the city to uh, amend and refine any legalization program. 
um, so we don't end up back here in short order. Thank you. We will now move to Shravanti Conical, followed by April MacGyver and Kadisha Davis. Um, good afternoon, Chair Sanchez and Time members of the Council. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Sanchez, members of the Council. Uh, my name is Shravanti Kaneka, and I'm the Resiliency Planner with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, also known as NIJA. I'm testifying today on behalf of NIJA and the Climate Works for All Coalition, uh, which has actively been working to first pass Local Law 97 and then towards its equitable implementation um, since, since, since its introduction in 2019. Um, I will be speaking specifically to the pieces um, of um, the pieces of intro 875, specifically around renewable energy credits. Um, Climbworks for All strongly supports the need to limit the percentage of a building's electricity overage that can be offset by RECs. This will encourage more building retrofits, reduce emissions, and uphold the intent of Local Law 97 to decarbonize our buildings, ensuring that buildings transition away from using fossil fuels can have a number of beneficial air quality and health impacts, especially in environmental justice communities. As per analysis conducted by the Comptroller's Office, if RECs were applicable only to 10% of electricity overage, the overall reduction in emissions would be 93%. Um, if that limit was set at 30%, building, um, building emissions reductions would be at 79%. This analysis makes it clear that restrictions on the use of RECs for compliance would preserve the ability of Local Law 97 to achieve its goal to significantly reduce emissions in New York City's building sector. Climate Works for All supports um, a 10% rec limit um, with no more than 30% of a building's overage. Um, additionally, a coalition wants to see rapid decarbonization of buildings to meet state and climate goals. False solutions and technologies such as carbon capture that don't actually reduce carbon emissions are not the path forward to local R97 compliance. And we are increasingly concerned with technologies like this being developed and deployed um, in the city as we speak with minimal oversight. Um, I'd also like to highlight a couple of amendments to um, the legislation. Uh, we're calling for Time some of the expired. language. Um, I can submit um, you, you can further written up. comments. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Chair. I just made a, uh, just two more points. Um, we'd like the um, legislation to have language that says the department may by rule limit um, the amount of a deduction and uh, sorry, we'd like the legislation to change that from the department may to the department shall. This is to confirm DOB's authority um, to ensure that a limit is actually uh, put on the purchase of RECs and it will be implemented. Um, and we also recommend that a REC limit be um, introduced as soon as possible or that a clear timeline be um, given for when those regulations will be determined. Um, and lastly, um, we'd like a clear explanation of what environmental justice impacts are being considered um, and, um, and to clarify who, if anyone, will be consulted, would DOB will be consulted um, on this particular issue. Uh, we want to make sure that co-pollutant and emissions reductions are in EJ communities and that there are no unintended consequences um, in communities that have historically suffered from air pollution. Um, sorry for going over, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. No problem. Thank you so much. Very helpful. Thank you. We will next hear from April MacGyver, Kadisha Davis, and Sadia Rahman. Starting time. Uh, I believe April MacGyver is not on, so we will move to Kadisha Davis. Starting time. Okay, I believe Kadisha Davis is no longer on, so we will move to Sadia Rahman. Starting time. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Sanchez and the rest of the committee. Um, good afternoon, and I'm sorry, I'm catching my breath. I just ran out to go pick up my kids and came back, um, so I'm a little out of breath. Um, my name is Sadia Rahman. I am the Deputy Director of Policy at Chaya CDC. Um, which was founded to address the housing and economic needs of low-income South Asian and Indo-Caribbean New Yorkers. Um, Chai is a founding member of the New York City-based campaign, and for over 15 years, the campaign has been fighting on behalf of low-income homeowners 
and basement tenants to make their apartments a safe, legal part of the housing stock in New York City. We support the Resolution 161, which calls on the state legislature to pass A9802 and S8783. As you are all aware, New York has long suffered an affordable housing crisis, and the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the issues of struggling tenants and homeowners. On the front line of this crisis are low and moderate income immigrants, communities of color, and essential workers. Many are undocumented and have limited English proficiency. And basement apartments are one of the few affordable housing options available to many in our communities. Tenants are struggling to find affordable housing. Aspiring homeowners can no longer afford to buy in their neighborhoods. And existing homeowners are struggling to make their mortgage payments with rising inflation costs. Legalizing basements, um, basement units can be the difference between sustainable home ownership and displacement. These apartments are also a means to add to the affordable housing stock, preserve our diverse communities, and prevent displacement. With the passage of this legislation, in time, thousands of affordable housing units would be created. Best of all, the beneficiaries of the rental income wouldn't be sort of large-scale developers, but instead struggling homeowners. Um, the bill is a strong tool to prevent the type of displacement that threatens low and moderate um, income homeowners, particular immigrants and communities of color who have been ex historically marginalized. And as Council Member Barron mentioned earlier, these are also sort of victim, historic victims of like racism. Time expired. Public housing po policies. Um, many members have referenced the catas catas catastrophe of Hurricane Ida. If we don't move forward on this, then we go backwards. And if Ida proved anything, it's that we can't afford to go backwards. We cannot afford to, um, to go to the pre-pilot policy of heightened enforcement with DOB fines, vacate orders, and evictions. We need to move forward, and we need to create a pathway. Um, and this resolution and the and the state bills um, are the first step to creating um, like safe, um, livable conditions for uh, New Yorkers living in basement apartments. Thank, Thank you, you um, and I appreciate the time to testify. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will now move to Rami Denawi, Kyra Armstrong, or Kira Armstrong, and Duong Nok Fan. Bat. Starting time. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Sanchez and members of the committee, um, for the opportunity to be able to testify and provide feedback for you here today. My name is Rami Denawi. I am the Environmental Justice Coordinator for El Puente, a human rights organization based in South Williamsburg and a member of the Climate Works for All Coalition. I'm here to talk to you about the provision in Intro 875 that addresses renewable energy credits as it pertains to Local Law 97. Um, seeing as Local Law 97's compliance period is upon us, um, we call on the administration to add an amendment that outlines a timeline for when these regulations and rules on RECs uh, will be determined. In addition, we are also calling on DOB to limit renewable energy credits to 10% of building overage, and that is to ensure compliance of almost 93% of uh, targeted buildings. Um, this per percentage is based on a thorough report released by the Comptroller in late, late of last year. The legislation also mentions EJ impacts as a key consideration as it relates to renewable energy credits. So we call on DOB to explain and clarify what does the agency consider to be environmental justice impacts and whether DOB will require an environmental justice uh, expert uh, board or advisory board to consult on this matter. Finally, to avoid any mis misinterpretation of the directive that this legislation affords DOB, we call on changing the language verb from may to shall um, to move us to a more uh, definitive uh, answer that will ensure DOB's authority on this matter. I want to thank you for your time and for the opportunity to allow us to testify, and we will be submitting written testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rami. Thank you. We will now hear from Kira Armstrong, followed by Duong Nok Fat. It appears that Kira Armstrong is no longer present, um, so we will move to Duong Nok Fat. Starting time. Okay, it appears this individual is also no longer the on the Zoom call, which brings us to the end of public testimony. 
Thank you so much. I want to thank the committee staff, uh, my, my staff, uh, the district office for a great hearing. Thank you to the administration for your testimony and participation. I look forward to being a partner in the legalization of basement apartments and to uh, protecting the climate goals of local law 97 together. Thank you.